Sarah Webb, thank you so much for coming on the Inner Edison podcast. I really appreciate you being on here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. And let me go through my little spiel of podcasting yeah. since I, yeah, yeah. I've been doing radio since 2018, so I learned a little bit since then. So, and I don't know if you know my background, but I'm actually in the mortgage industry. So it was unique to come on to that industry back in 2018 and talk about it. But it's not about me today. It's about the people who are here. And it's an Inner Edison podcast. It's about your greatest accomplishments come from your greatest defeats. So we're, you know, entrepreneurs. And I know you're a fractional CFO, if I remember right. Yes, that's correct. And what does that mean for somebody who has no idea what a fractional CFO is? Yeah. So it's maybe we're helping businesses that are not ready for a full-time CFO. And so maybe they have a bookkeeper or an accountant that helps them with the day-to-day. -day and we step in just as they need strategy and forecasting, sometimes budgeting. So they don't need a full-time person to do that because they're not there yet. So they just need a fraction of a person. And so that's where we kind of fit into that gap with small businesses. All right. So let's back up a second. CFO is a chief financial officer. At what point do you need somebody in your business like that? Because for most people, entrepreneurs, they're, you know, they're smaller shop, one person, a few other people, they have their bookkeeper and their accountant. Sometimes they're together. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes a bookkeeper works and sometimes they don't. Um, that happens a lot. When did the CFO step in? When is that point for somebody? Yeah, I think it's when you're wanting to put the turbo on growth. So for small startups that maybe they're looking at an IPO and they want to go that route, you're going to definitely need a, CP, a CFO to walk you through those different stages. If you've been growing your business and you've been building it year after year, but maybe you're above, you know, 5 million to 7 million and you're like, I want to hit 15 million in the next few years, that would be the time that I would reach out to a CFO. So it kind of depends on the path that you're taking for your business. But if you're a small business and you're just you know, building year over year and it's working for you, you probably don't need a CFO. It's really when you're wanting to make a strategy change or really power up that growth factor. So when you want, so the CFO is somebody who helps you plan for the future. Uh, bookkeeper just keeps track of stuff. The accountant files the stuff, basically bottom line. And then the CFO would step in as I'm the one to help you focus on how we're going to get to where you want to go. Is that yes. what I'm hearing? Okay. Yes, those are all important things. You have to have the data accurate, but the CFO is the forward looking person where the accountant and maybe the tax preparer are more backwards looking, right? They're looking mm -hmm. at right now in 2024, they're doing your 2023 tax return. There's no value add to that to help you make decisions or um, there's really no value add in that period. Um, the IRS already knows what you owe them. And you said today your biggest win was getting a hold of the IRS or something today. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, being on hold, calling and sorting some of that for uh, clients, you know, calling is painful. It can take a long time. Maybe you don't have the right piece of paper or ask the right question. And so we'll sometimes step in and handle that for some of our clients on a case by case basis. I also, you get these letters and they're scary to a lot of people when in reality, they just want a phone call to see that you know that what you need to do and how to move forward. Um, but a lot of people look at it and freak out. But I mean, because you can do everything right and still get a letter because somebody in your whole team didn't do what they were supposed to do. Yeah, they didn't click a box or, you know, something missed a signature. I mean, it can be something tiny and sometimes it can be easily resolved. And then sometimes you're paying back and forth either through the phone or mail. Um, the IRS is really overwhelmed right now, even though they've hired a lot of new people. Um, so we're as a practitioner, even when I call, sometimes I'm training the person that I'm getting on the line. It's like, I think what you're asking me is this and what form you want is this. Um, Cause they're just so new right now. Um, and they're so, and this is what I try to explain to a lot of people. I know I'm like, if you're because this is like the eighties, I'm older than you, but in the eighties, there was a lot of IRS agents and they came after especially schedule C people um, mm -hmm. because they were easy to come after. Um, you always, you know, they could get you for five grand or 10 grand and you don't have a CPA, a bookkeeper usually, or somebody who'll help you fight it. So it was an easy win. But if you have a corporation, LLC, those type of things, most those, there's only like what 1% of them that get audited on average, we'll say, I'm just saying it's a, you're in a bigger pool and it's, they don't normally jump after those unless there's something they see. And I could be totally wrong, but that's just what I've seen over years that especially right now when they're hiring, hired so many new agents to get the tax revenue, to increase the tax revenue so that they can, because they already spent it and they want to get that money in, they're going to come after everybody a lot more, but they're going to go for the easy ones. Yeah. Am I wrong? And 
No, I think that's absolutely correct. And I think one way, if you want to be on the easy to attack list is to not make your payroll taxes and some of those easy to do things, right? So you need to be filing your quarterly payroll tax returns. That's where I see a lot of people, if they're tight on cash, they're like, oh, I just won't make that payment this week or this month. Um, and that snowballs into bigger problems. And you're talking payroll for like your employees payroll, or you're not talking about your supplemental, t the taxes that you might want to put in for yourself. You're talking about the, for the company payroll yeah. taxes, correct? Yes. I'm talking and about then the you payroll also make taxes. Sure yeah. And the retirement, right? Like if you're not, if you're, if you have a retirement plan and you haven't made your team's retirement contributions, you're basically stealing money from your employees. But when people are short on cash, those are two of the areas that I see them cut back on and think that they'll be able to get caught up on it. Or a bookkeeper forgot to send it in. Yeah. And then you don't know about it for a year later. Then all of a sudden you got this financial thing. Yes, I've seen that too. Yep. Yeah. I mean, because we've made changes in my in my industry in the last year and a half. And then you're like, okay, everything's good. Then all of a sudden you get this letter that you owe. And I gave it to my new accountant because I had a further away accountant so they can talk. And he's like, yeah, you just need to make arrangements. <laughs> and it's, it, you try to do everything right. And then, but every, you can't handle everything. That's why you need the right people in place. Yeah. And one of the things I think the biggest issue is with the bookkeepers. One of the biggest issues. Yeah. Um, we're, what we're seeing for some of our clients who are transitioning from other bookkeepers to working with our firm is we're, we're seeing a lot of fraud, right? So there's a fraud triangle, it's opportunity, it's pressure and rationale. And so in small businesses, there's a lot more opportunity because there's not as many people. Generally one person has, you know, access to the checking checkbook, ACH, all that online. I think as a business owner, you need to be asking for the bank reconciliations and bank statements each month. You may not know how to complete them, but you do know how to line up side by side. Okay. Oh my gosh, there's a payment to American Express. I don't even have American Express. I have, I have a MasterCard. What's going on here? Um, some of those big things, um, easy to spot things can be avoided. Yeah, we had two firms in Modesto. One was a marketing lady who spent about a million dollars of their money on stuff to her house during the whole thing. And another one had been with her company for six years and she was in the internal person and she spent 1.6 million. And what happened was a check was bouncing at the bank and they called to say, Hey, you don't have enough funds in here for this check. And the guy's like, that's not one of our vendors. And they found out that the person internally had been stealing that much money over six years. And the other person was over the last couple of years. And so yeah. that's what you run into because you expect people to do what's best, but they don't always. And you have to also that one that did the marketing person had two other people on the inside who were helping. Yeah. That's a collusion is very hard to, to get to, uh, to, to stop it. But yeah, just some types of checks and balances separate the person who's actually writing the check or doing the ACH. Um, for some of my business owners, maybe their bookkeeper prepares everything and they have, they call it check signing Friday or, you know, clicking online on Friday. And the business owner is the actual person, only person that can uh, release the checks or release the funds or another person in the office so that there's two different people. Gotcha. And I mean, the big thing is you have to sign the checks, right? You have the owner sign the checks and then you can see at that time what they're for. But sometimes we're in a hurry and we're, and we're, we expect people to do right. Um, my current accountant has, he, he wants to be the bookkeeper because he's like, I'm tired of all these problems. I can set it up properly from the beginning. There's no issue going forward. I'm the one that want to handle it, but I'll use anybody you want it. Well, after they say that, who are you going to do, but except use him, right? Yeah. So. Cause I came from a huge firm out of San Diego. They were huge and they were great, but I'm not that big anymore. Like I used to be just because of what's going on with our industry right now. Eventually I'll be back there, but it's nice to cut costs during this period of time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there's different types of accountants, different sizes of firms. Um, there's really the right fit and right person and right group for everyone. It, it's not a one time, one size fits all. Now, where are you out of? I am in Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. Yeah. But we serve clients from East coast to West coast. We're here in the middle of the country. So we're working in, you know, all Eastern time to Pacific time. Uh, we're primarily serving private medical practices and law offices. Uh, so working with those business owners who are kind of striking it out on their own. And generally they have a really small staff. They have, you know, collections and payables and all those types of things that every small business has. Uh, but so your niche, it, you just said was law and I mean, law offices and medical billing. 
private medical practices. Oh, mm -hmm. private medical practice. Sorry. Yeah. I just heard medical. Sorry. Yeah. So, so that's a unique, and that's why I tell everybody with, with the business, you have to have a niche. You have to niche it down to who your perfect client is. That doesn't mean you can't take additional people that come across that way, but you focus mainly on those people. And so that that's who you want. But they might go, could you help John next next to me? He needs some help, right? I mean, you're not going to turn away business unless it's a pain in the butt business. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. So we have what we call the no jerk policy. So we don't work with jerks. Um, but yeah, we are focused our marketing marketing and messaging on private medical practices and attorneys. But you know, if we get a referral from someone and they're a great co company to work with, we'll definitely work with them. I got into, my husband's an attorney, so he has... I had to do his accounting when he first started his practice. And so that was how we became specialized in um, Clio. It's a certain software for attorneys and then private medical practices. I come from pharmaceutical industry and so had some connections there. What's interesting about that is some of those physicians have inventory. And so we find that just to be a little bit more challenging than, you know, a, a service only business. So that's, that's kind of how we got into those two spots. Gotcha. What's the biggest, one of the biggest challenges that, small businesses run into cash flow. I mean, it's always cash it was just on the phone about someone's cash flow for the next, you know, 90 days, looking at what vendors they owe, what their receivables look like, who we need to put pressure on. Um, when I send out uh, monthly financial statements, I'm always looking at, you know, their, their ratios of how quickly they're taking in cash versus the outflow. Um, a lot of people have really great businesses and great business models and, you know, but if you extend credit to someone, that's you're creating additional risk, additional layer of complexity. Um, so it's something you always have to keep your eye on. And when you mean you extend credit, that just means you're you're giving them terms. Are yeah, you you're giving them terms for thirty to sixty days, right? So private medical practices, they don't have a lot of choice if they take insurance. They're kind of at the beholden to these insurance companies. They may pay at ninety days, one hundred and twenty days. Um, if they click the wrong box, then that's a denial and it starts out the whole process over again. So for physicians, you know, tracking that and working with their billing department is really important. Um, for attorneys, they generally do take a retainers. You know, they're not as, they don't have the same kind of collection challenges, challenges, but the, you know, your customer, depending on your customer, if they're a corporate or if they're a private individual, you know, that is still an area that you have to be looking at. But you can take a case and you get a retainer, use up the retainer, and then they need to get refilled and they don't they don't refill it because one thing or another, the you know, there's certain things that can happen. So I mean there's so many challenges that are out there. So you said cash flow is the biggest one, which is obvious. What's the next one? I think payroll. So just having the right team and payroll from a dollar perspective for sure, but also just being the type of employer that you want to be, being competitive in terms of like comprehensive benefits or flexible work arrangements. I think it's a very competitive employee market right now. And so these, you know, service providers can't provide that level of service they need unless they have a great team. And so I think I always kind of tease this like business would be so easy if it didn't involve people. Right. Um, but it's through people and team members is kind of what helps us get to that next level. And it's getting, and like you said, it's challenge. It's getting, it's, it's not that it's not enough people out there, just not great quality of person, people out there. That's what I, find. I mean, there's people, I'm just saying that. Yeah, there's people in, you've got to staff the right person in the right job. Um, the person who maybe is your front desk person is obviously not your paralegal or your medical tech, right? They, they have different skill sets. So it's finding um, their unique skill set, either education wise, but also personality wise. What I have d did in the last few years, because I could never find that right person to answer the phones. I, hi I hired this company called Front Office, and you would never know they're not your front office. Yeah. And, and they invest tons of training to like yeah. make people feel that way. They just do a yeah. great job. And they always, because everybody always, man, your people at the front desk are amazing. <laughs> it's like, okay, whatever you say. <laughs> it's just, but it also, it's one less headache I have to worry about. So and so didn't show up today. Oh, who's going to answer the phones? I don't want to answer the phones. I got work to do. You know, I mean, that's what you run into with that. Well, and we can be that as a fractional CFO service, right? So for some of our clients, we're their entire accounting department. We're handling all aspects of that. And so if someone doesn't show up, someone else on our team does it. Or, you know, they don't have to worry about validating is, is this a good accountant or not? Because if you're a dentist, you're really not qualified to know if you have a good accountant or not. Now, you know, when you have a bad one a few years later, kind of the, some of the things that we've talked about, yeah. but 
you know, I'm in the position to, to qualify someone and say, okay, this person is doing a good job or this is an area where they need training. Um, over, so how long have you been doing this? About 20 years. Um, I've been a solo, fr uh, the fractional CFO about six years, but I've, I'm a CPA. I did tax returns when I was a baby accountant. So, um, kind of always in the financial space. So, I mean, but you've seen it all. Yeah. I mean, I've been on fraud investigations. I've, I've traveled the world and looked at, you know, different companies and how they're structured and what their setups are. Uh, yeah, it's been a, it's, been, it's a, been way more interesting than I thought accounting would be. Is there a better structure for a company to be set up by? I think it's all about your end goal, right? If you want to IPO and you want to be on the exchange, you need to set up as a C corp or, you know, certain different units. If you're a solo practitioner and that's, you don't want team members and you don't want certain things, you know, maybe an S corp, but yes, I think the legal entity structure that you pick at the beginning is critical. And sometimes our goals change. And so sometimes we have to change that. But I think if you have an understanding of where you want to go um, between accountants and attorneys, we can say, okay, this is the best type of structure based on what you're telling me where you're going to be in the next three to five years. Gotcha. I mean, because it's important. I mean, we just talked about in the beginning how not to be a C corp. No, I mean, not a C corp, but a Schedule C, because of the fact of what could happen to you. Yeah, right. I'm an S corp person. I love S corps. I think for most small businesses and service providers, they are the way to go. Um, it's an easy way to pay yourself. You've got a lot of tax protection. You've got a lot of liability protection. Um, that's generally my default, unless someone tells me, you know, I'm going to go do this crazy thing, or I'm working on a novel drug therapy and I've got to raise a bunch of money. But um, I would say my default is the S Corp. It's my favorite legal entity. I mean, there are companies who have multiple LLCs depending on what, you know, like I think Disneyland has it for each one of their seats or something, a different LLC. So yeah. that way if they get sued, that that seat gets sued only, you know, and that's the smartest thing. So you have, when you, and I think most people come into business not thinking that way. How do I protect myself? They think, I just want to start this business. I want to do this. And they first thing, they don't even know who their perfect client is. So they shouldn't even do anything until they know who that is. Um, because you can't brand towards that until you know who you're trying to get to. Uh, and I think that's the big that's the biggest thing I run into. Because there's people on here I've talked to who's been in business. And I, I they're telling me who their client is. I'm like, that's not who your client is. Your client is this. Yeah. Because from what I heard from what you just said and how, what everything about it, that's what your client is. I had a lady from London and she was telling me all this stuff. And I said, well, that's not who your perfect client. Your perfect client is a veteran who is a female veteran who blah, blah, blah. And she's like, oh, my God, it is. You know, so it's easier for us on the outside to tell you, you or somebody else what their thing is. Just, But it's harder for us to look at ourselves to tell us what we should do. Well, and I've, I mean, for myself, that's changed over time, right? When I started in 2018, I just needed to make some money. So if you, if you do a small business, I was like, yes, I'm perfect. We're a great fit. And we've refined that over time and figured out what we're good at and what kind of clients we can serve best. Well, I mean, you need to know that because, I mean, because you are a fractional CFO. So that means you, you know, you guys are planning for people's future. Um, and sometimes like you run into things that you can't plan for. Yeah. Um, like in my industry, we didn't think interest rates would go up 5% in six months. Um, I mean, I kind of did when the pipeline was stopped, but that's beside the point. You know, I was hoping it wouldn't. But yeah. I don't get into too much politics, <laughs> but it does play a part. It, government and politics plays a part in your business all the time, whether or not, you know, you try to focus on this is what my plan is. All of a sudden you get slammed with something and it changes everything and it stops certain things. And so how do you protect yourself in situations like that? I mean, I think always being flexible, always uh, searching for advice of, you know, what's going on. I mean, when COVID happened, a lot of people weren't prepared to do the PPP or the employee retention credits. And so they had to educate themselves really quickly and figure out if they qualified or not. And now we're seeing there are a lot of people that didn't spend the time on the education and they've got some big IRS problems with a lot of fraud. Um, but I think being, being open right, to on, learning. Before you keep going, what do you mean they have a lot of problems? So the employee retention credit right now, mm -hmm. there's a, moratorium on processing those. There's been a lot of fraudulent claims and this is the Senate and the Congress. This is one of their number one targets that they're looking. If you, There's a lot of companies, there's a lot of credit mills out there calling people and telling them they qualify for the employee retention credit when they don't and they're filing false claims. And the IRS has said this is their number one problem and their number one focus right now. So if you filed a claim and you one, you didn't have any employees or you weren't shut down, um, you might need to consider reaching out to someone to 
to claw back that claim because because it's being audited. Yeah, because they came after me and they're like, well, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, we weren't shut down um, because we I mean, it was the busiest time we've ever had, even though it was. And I try to explain to people when things are so crazy, when you gear up towards it, the first six months to what a year, you don't get anything back. You're paying to add and add and add and add. The last six months is when you make your money. Yeah. On those refinance booms. So and, and being flexible to do that, right? Right. Yeah, but it's with AI, it's going to be so much easier going forward. So we'll see. You're, why you're smiling because I mean, <laughs> I, 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 think, I ran into I something. We're all, I think we're already using a lot of machine learning. I think a lot of AI is already being utilized. I don't have like this fear that it's taking over the world or it's, you know, it's going to make our jobs easier and it's going to allow uh, smart people to do even higher level thinking. So I, there's a lot of, you know, oh, it's going to take over the world and it's going to eliminate all these jobs. No, I think it's going to advance those who know how to use it. And I think that for jobs where it's it could replace someone, yes, of course, but it could also, you know, allow them to learn a new school and up level what they're able to offer. Yeah, I feel it's going to get rid of the lower end jobs and middle and some middle that you don't really need because certain things that can be done better. Uh, and, and I use it for video and uh, transcribing and so much stuff. Now it's it's just amazing. And uh, there's nothing that I write that I don't throw in there real quick to see if I need to make any changes. But the difference is I go and edit it and take out those standard words that it throws in there because there's certain phrases, certain standard words, certain lines that that's going to give you. You have to take that stuff out. Otherwise, yeah. people know it was chat GPT. My sixth grader was telling me that her teacher told her to put her paper in her. She wrote some five paragraph, you know, essay for sixth grade. They told them to put it into Grammarly and see how it made it made it better. You know, and so they're they're training um, students how to use the tools that are available. Yeah. I mean, so let's get to a point where you're not going to. The long time ago, they said, you know what the difference between a good speller and a bad speller was? And most people go, no. And they go, well. A good speller knows when a word spelled wrong, a bad speller has no idea. And that's where we're going to get to if you don't understand both sides. Even though you use it to make it better, you really need to understand certain parts. Because you can type anything now and it's like misspelled. You don't even have to think. But you you should know, oh, that looks like it's misspelled anyway. Just because it has the little red lines underneath it doesn't mean anything. Yes. But but I, I think it's just going to help us so much more. And what I mean, I... I I had a thing yesterday when I it was a voice one and I talked to it. It was on, it was a new thing. And I'm telling you, it you can't tell that it's AI. There you go. And that's going to, that will be for people to, you know, schedule appointments, schedule this, schedule that, you know, I'm so-and-so, you know, to help Ed do this. And that's what it's going to be for, which is perfect. Cause you don't need somebody at, especially in the state of California at 20 bucks, 22 bucks an hour to do that. Yeah, you use them to work on a higher level project, you know, where they are able to apply. That's starting more. wages, by the way. Yeah. And I'm in Texas. It's definitely different. Yeah, I know. Your minimum wage, I think, is what, 723 or something like that? It's close to that, yes. Yeah, and our minimum wage for, you know, and that's the worst thing is what they did with all the um, restaurants, you know, the fast food that has to do it. Um, but if you, you know, if you bake bread, you don't have to. So all the Paneras didn't have to do it because the governor's friend who donated to his thing owned 16 Paneras. Oh, goodness. That's that's the deal, what we're dealing with. One of the things we're just dealing with is $11 billion to make 16 feet, 1,600 feet of high-speed rail that's in the middle of nowhere. And they're, they're patting themselves on the back that this thing happened in 2018 and finished that. And then since then, they haven't done anything, but they wasted $11 billion. And when I, so what I'm, I'm going to get to a point here in a second, they're going to, so that's our government wasting money, has no idea where $24 million went for the homeless here in California. They have no idea where they misplaced the money, but you misplace 600 bucks or you misplace something. They're coming after you and you need to, you need to protect yourself. Yeah. yeah. No one said it's fair. Life's fair. So, it is definitely life is not fair. Yeah. That was the first thing my dad taught me. Yeah. It, it hit me anyway. Uh, moving forward. All right. So how does somebody start working with somebody like yourself? I mean, uh, and you, and you said when you're ready, but maybe people don't know they're ready. You know, they've been doing it so long by themselves. They want to get to that next level. Cause you said IPO, how many of your companies you work with go IPO? 
Not very many. And that's not their plan, right? So for a lot of small, it's not my plan. I don't want to be in an IPO, but no, you got, now you have to worry about everything else. And I got to worry about everything. So, you know, when you're looking for that financial strategy, when you're looking to do something different, maybe you're launching a new product line, or maybe you're asking yourself, can I take on, you know, three or four new team members? When you're at this point, when you're, I'm looking for a substantial amount of growth and I don't know how to get there. That's where a CFO can be helpful. Or if you're kind of stressed about everything, um, if you're one of those people that says, I says I made all this money on paper, but I don't know how I'm going to pay myself. That's when you need a CFO um, because we can help you cash flow things. We can help you plan for those expenditures and, and make sure that you're paying yourself. So I think when you're kind of having a fundamental question of what's next or how do I solve this, that's when a a partner can really be beneficial. And it doesn't have to be forever. Maybe someone helps you for six months and then you know, helps you with plan and checks in once a quarter. This doesn't have to be a, we're, we're together for the rest of your life. Or it's not every day of the week. Right. It's, it's just, you're pl helping them plan for the future. And so that's what you're looking at. What can I do to help you for your future? What's our plan? What have you done? You know, it's, I'm almost like a, a fractional CFO is almost like a coach. Yeah. A financial because, coach. Yeah. You don't have a coach talk to you every day but you're given things that you need to do that you need to take care of so that the next meeting you have with that person, it's there for you so you can move forward to the next phase. Am I getting close? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have a coach and if I don't turn something in, I just feel terrible. Or if I'm running behind, like, here's why, you know, it's, it's all about accountability. This is accountability with your finances. All right, Sarah, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Yep. Our website is web, W E B B C F O.com. So that has a little bit about our team and some of our services. All right. And is there, so you said no jerk policy. So if you're no a jerk, jerk one time, you're out of there. We might, we give a little grace. We just have to say, you know, like this is, this is how we work together. But if you start off being a jerk, yeah, you're not going to get taken on as a client. I've told my staff many times to fire my clients if they're rude. Exactly. If you're that. rude to my staff, it's yeah. definitely not going to work out. But see, I'm a veteran, so I'm direct. So there's a difference, right? There's a difference between being rude and being direct. Because the reason I bring this up, I talk to somebody else's staff and I ask them, how come it took them so long to do something that I know takes all of two minutes? It was about an appraisal. And I get a call from the branch manager. Don't you ever talk to my staff like that? You mean just asking questions? Okay. But, you know, that's how, that's a different thing. Sarah, so, uh, all right, if everybody wants to get in contact with you, you said it's web cfo.com yes is that right that okay. is correct thank right. you also having the notes below and again sarah thanks so much for coming on the show today i really appreciate you being here yep absolutely have a great afternoon